There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, Right. For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Shauna, I'm answering a question from Laquita about what I think some of the biggest money myths are and what to do instead. It's going to be juicy. Hey there, welcome to Everyone's Talking Money. I'm your host, Shauna Gam, and it is so good to have you with us for this Friday Ask Shauna episode. These are some of my favorites. I know I say this every single week, but I truly mean it. I love getting able to interact with you as the community and share your money questions and to be able to answer them in just kind of a fun, unscripted way. You never know what's going to happen. Sometimes I talk over myself. Sometimes I mispronounce words. I just kind of go with it. It's fun for me as also a podcaster because the other episodes I try to keep clean and polished and really just sounding amazing. And these ones, I just kind of pretend like we're sitting across from each other in a coffee shop or my favorite dessert place, and we're just having a conversation about money. We had a couple of great episodes the last couple of weeks, if you have not checked these out. We had Brad Nelson, who is author of The Body Code and The Emotion Code books. And he talked about this idea of dropping your emotional money baggage, which I am all about that. And whether you think you have emotional money baggage or not, I'll just break it to you. You probably have emotional money baggage because money is just inherently so emotional. We don't talk about that piece of money normally, but you know we do that here. And then we also had Mignon Francois on. She talked about turning her last $5 into $10 million into this cupcake empire. And she had this really tough decision of does she use her money to feed her family or does she use her money to try to grow, grow that money, grow wealth, like create something different for her family. And her story just really touched me. And I think her spirit about life, because I know that I can feel just really stuck in the monotony of life. And I've kind of been going through this lately where I'm just looking at my life and I'm thinking, like, am I enjoying this all? Am I, am I having fun? Like, does this all make sense? Things feel, I think, just a little bit heavy to me lately. And 
I don't know. I just I just want to share that with you. So if you're if you're feeling that yourself, know you are in very good company. All right, we're going to move on from <laughs> from that 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 darker place. Also, if you are not on the, our email newsletter club, I invite you to do so. You can go to etmpod.link slash email club. That link will be in the show notes. Sign up for the weekly email series. I do a Money Tip Tuesday, and I'm trying to do more like behind the scenes stuff, behind the scenes of the podcast and just of my life and really of my own journey about my relationship with money and everything that I learn and that I'm infusing into you. I am bringing that all in a new way in 2024. So I would love to have you join us. I'm going to try to do some exclusive workshops and all sorts of different things like that with everybody who's on my email list. So without further ado, let's dive in. This Ask Shauna I'm Answering is a question from Laquita. And she says, Shauna, your podcast has saved my life. I can't tell you what a mess I was before. I felt all over the place and wasn't motivated, even though I wanted to change things. I was recently talking to my girlfriends about money and how some people, you know who I'm talking about, I'm sure, say we have to follow the rules. It doesn't feel right to me. I thought it might be interesting to have an episode about some money myths that we've been told that aren't actually true. Thanks again. I recommend your show to everyone. I'm even a bit aggressive about it. All right, Laquita, I love that a little bit aggressive, hopefully not, you know, in a too aggressive way, but I'm a big fan of of grabbing your friends and family's cell phone and just going to the podcast app and just adding this podcast. I'm a big fan of that. You should, you know, give it a try <laughs> because, you know, it's tough running an independent podcast like this and we are celebrating our ninth year. We started out as Millennial Money. I don't know if you've been listening since then, but we changed the name in 2022. And uh, yeah, so the show has evolved quite a bit over the years, but it can only continue to evolve if all of you are kind of my little army on the street out there being a little bit aggressive about getting the show on people's podcast players. But uh, I really love this, this question. And yeah, I do have a feeling of maybe some of those money experts that you're talking about that are talking about following rules. And I I understand it because in a way our human brains really need rules. We need structure, right? Discipline. We talk about if you have a kid and you don't discipline them, then they're kind of all over the place. They need some sort of boundaries and some sort of structure. So, I understand that when it comes to money of really needing that that structure. And I think that it's great as long as you look at rules from a lens of, does that work for me and for my life? Or does it maybe bring up more money shame or money trauma or negative thoughts and feelings about money that keep me in a place that feels stuck or or just I'm more stressed out, right? So you you have to look at everything through that lens. And I think we're not used to stepping back from our money, you know, and looking at things from that perspective because we all collectively feel this need to be good with our money. We collectively feel the need to make the right decisions and to do the right things with our money and to build wealth and to make sure that we never run out of money and The laundry list. I could go on and on and on with the laundry list of things that we just automatically, as humans living here in society, feel no matter where you live around the world. So I I like rules, but then I also like, can you take that rule and adapt it to see how it works for you? So if I had money rules at all, I think they would definitely be gentler which isn't everybody's approach. I'm not here. I'm never here um, to yell at you or to tell you that you've done something wrong. That is just not, that's just not my MO. That's just not how I operate. So actually, um, last year I was, I was working with a coach and they wanted me to write a manifesto for the show. And I, I haven't really shared it publicly, but I think now feels like a good time. I could be a little vulnerable with you. So this is what I wrote. Welcome to the new way to money. 
where we boldly opt out of the negative self-talk and thinking about money, where we embrace intentionality and celebrate self-worth over net worth, where we live authentically and let our money tell the story of us, where we make our own money rules and define this thing called success, where we decide what a rich life truly is and walk freely in that direction, where we high-five progress over perfection because money is truly personal. This is the battle cry for the role money will play in our lives. So that, I know those aren't rules, right? That's not telling you put X amount of money in your savings and make sure you're investing this amount. But to me, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a feeling of how I want you to feel about your money. How I want you to feel when you look at rules to decide whether it works for you and your money and not get stuck in thinking that if you don't check these 10 things off the list, that you're not going to be successful with your money. But to answer your question a little bit more directly, this was a fun one for me just to think about (laughs) in terms of this episode. So I came up with a couple of money myths, okay, more than a couple. I think I came up with, I don't know, 10 money myths that I, I see often that I think we just need to have a conversation about. So the first one is, is that money is only about the math. And you know by now that is actually so not true because about 80 to 90% of your money habits and your beliefs are based on your thoughts and your feelings. So if being successful financially was only about the math, we wouldn't need this show at all or any of the resources around your finances. It would really just be a simple plug and play. It would be rules based. It would be do these things and, you know, you know, this plus this equals this, right? It would be that simplistic. But it's not because so much of what we do with our money is based around our emotions and our habits and our beliefs and things that are in there that maybe you haven't even worked on yet. And those are influencing the decisions that you make. So that equation gets really wonky. It isn't just about strict math. I wish it was. It would make things a heck of a lot easier. So the second myth is that being wealthy is a number. And you know, you know this is not true, but it's really easy to get sucked into it. And I think you look at social media, you look at a lot of the reality shows, and it's clearly these people have a lot more money than a lot of us have. And they're living a very extravagant life and things look good and they look easy. But again, that's their reality and we're not seeing what's under the hood, right? And I have helped so many people who have had what I consider a ton of money, like hundreds of millions of dollars. And privately behind the scenes, they'll say to me, I have all this money, Shauna, but I don't feel wealthy. I don't feel secure. I don't feel like I can rest easy. And I know it sounds cliche, but wealth, I think it's it's really about every aspect of your life, your health, your money, your thoughts, your hobbies, your career, your family, your friends, et cetera, and how you use your money to help you live the life that you want. You can build wealth and be wealthy on any salary. And I can I can prove that to you time and time and time again because I have helped so many people who have very moderate to maybe what you would consider low salaries, but they're allocating their money in a really smart way. And they're also managing the emotional side of money. And so I I think that it's, it's too easy to get stuck thinking, well, when I reach X amount of dollars, then life is going to be suddenly (laughs) glamorous and amazing. And it, it might be, but it might not also change what's going on inside of you. So I think it's good to have a number that you're shooting for or, uh, you know, if, if I invest X amount of dollars and I reach this number, then I can maybe stop working or all of those things are great, very great goals to have. But if you're not doing the internal work of all of this other complexity that goes on around money, those things are just not going to feel as sweet when you arrive there. All right, money myth number three, 
that achieving your goals is only about saving money. I hear this time and time again, and I'll read blog articles and all sorts of things that talk about saving, 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 saving. And you can get such uh, just like a drain pipe thinking about how much money you're saving. But it's really about how you spend your money. Most of us are really bad at spending. Why? Because money is emotional. So you spend when you feel good and when you don't, and then everything in between without a whole lot of thought behind it. So here's a great little exercise I want you to try this week. I want you to pick one thing that you spent money on and say to yourself, this week I spent X dollars on X thing. And you say, that's pretty fascinating. That's really interesting. Hmm. No judgment, no shame. You're just being aware of how you're choosing to spend your money. You're kind of looking at yourself almost like from a mirror, like, oh, that's interesting. You chose to spend X amount of dollars on X thing. Hmm. Okay. So that's the awareness part. And this is usually also correlated with some sort of shock when you uncover how much you're spending on certain things. Like, wait a minute, I just vocalized out loud that I spent this much on this thing. (laughs) Wait a minute. And what happens, though, is that you usually or immediately you start passing blame on yourself. So it's much easier to just let money kind of stay in the shadows and to not really look at how you're spending your money because every dollar that you spend, right, is saying something. You're either spending it towards an expense that you have to pay, like all of those fixed expenses, or the extra money you're making choices with how you're spending that money. And when I bring in the word intentionality and I talk to you about spending plans and all those sorts of things, it's, it's you taking ownership over how you're spending your money. But this doesn't mean that because you choose to spend a hundred bucks going out for like a bowling night and happy hour with your friends, it doesn't mean that is a a wrong way to spend your money. That is a choice that you're making. And I just want you to think like, huh, is this okay? Like, am I okay with this? Maybe your answer is yes. Maybe your answer is no. Maybe it's somewhere in between, right? But you get to make that choice. You get to decide that. All right, let's shift gears for Money Myth. Number four, another money myth is that life insurance is a bad investment. Ask anybody who has ever needed life insurance and they will tell you how important it is. Just because some money experts like to talk about it as a negative expense, it doesn't mean it's a bad expense for you. I think if somebody is economically dependent on you, then it might make sense to look at life insurance. Maybe it's not appropriate for you at this stage of life. But maybe it is at a future stage of life. I did an Instagram live with kind of an Ask Shauna type esque thing this week. And somebody actually wrote in that she has a 401k and an IRA, and she bought an IUL policy, uh, indexed universal life policy. And she was wondering if this was a stupid decision. And my first piece of advice is. There aren't any stupid decisions. You make a decision in the moment with the best information you have, and that's what it is. And so, you know, there are so many different factors. Like, I can't tell you whether it makes sense just based off a question. I have to look at everything. I have to look under the hood, and I have to understand your goals and understand your reasoning. So, I, I, again, I think I think this is a myth because it's easy to just slap a label on something, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is a wrong decisions for you. Okay, money myth number five. You're going to earn whatever, let's call it X percentage in the stock market. So just coming out and saying that you should expect to earn 10% or 12% or 8% or whatever in the stock market, I think is a complete money myth and it's leading you down the wrong path. All we have is historical data. So the the average analyzed return since adopting about 500 stocks into the index, I think somewhere around 1957 to about the end of 2023 is 10.26%. But that doesn't mean you're going to get 10.26% every year. There are ups and downs. And I think basing your retirement guess or models on a certain number above this average doesn't always make sense. And it's really easy to go out and and search or 
or to post on Instagram like, oh, 2023 was an amazing year in the stock market, which it was. And, you know, the average return was was X and you should be getting that. And if you're not getting that, your retirement portfolio, you're not doing money right. Like, I, I just I don't like this language at all. My point is it, it's so individual. It depends on what you're invested in. It depends what your risk tolerance is. There's so many different factors that go in here. So I, I want you to not get stuck on making a certain percentage in the stock market. A lot of you have only been investing probably in very up years. Haven't seen a lot of the real dips that can happen in the stock market, but that's that's to be expected. And that's okay, right? I just don't want you to like hang your hat on one one number, that one thing has to happen. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. Nerdwallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news... Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic, and it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. 
After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Back to our money miss. I believe we're on number six, but I was just thinking about something as I'm chatting with you. I read an article, I think it was in, was it in the New York Times? I don't know, it was a recent article, and it was talking about these families who had one or two kids and who decided to live in really like studio apartments in New York and other expensive places. And they had this conscious choice of living basically in a one room, one room apartment, right? There isn't any separation of doors and the kid doesn't have their own room. But it was more important to them that they were in a certain neighborhood. And that's just a priority that they made. And so the article was talking about, well, is this a good thing? Is this not a good thing? Pros and cons. And as we're as we're running down these money myths, I was thinking about this article. Actually, I've been thinking about it a lot lately. I will I'll link in the show notes if you want to take a read. This to me is 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 a great a great example of being mindful with your money and intentionality. So these people have made the conscious choice that this is where they want to live. And in order to live in this specific place, this is the amount of money they can spend and this is what it actually affords them. And they're want to do life differently. They, you know, one of the couples talked about wanting to be all together and, you know, didn't mind that there wasn't separation between rooms or, you know, that they were all basically in a giant one room apartment. And so initially you could look at an article like that and you could be like, this is crazy. What are these people thinking? There's no like even room for the adults. Like, how do you do your couple business with the kid right there? Like, how do you work out those sorts of things? I mean, that's just where my brain goes. <laughs> you could go and and think about all of these different uh, negatives about that situation. And you're applying your lens of your life and your money and what you think is important to you or not. And so when we're talking about myths, it's kind of the same thing. Just because I say something or another money expert says it, or you read it, or you watch it on a YouTube video, it doesn't mean that it's appropriate for you, or it doesn't mean that you have to follow it to a T. And so because we've created the society of money feeling so complex and so overwhelming, it actually isn't. It actually is pretty simple. Like that is the crazy secret about money is that it is pretty simple at its core. But we've created all this stuff around it and all this fancy language. And so it can feel overwhelming. And so you're looking for the rules. You're looking for the serious how-to guide around money. So I just want to give you a little a little freedom with that. All right, let's get back to money myth number six. I think we're on six. I love this one. Your parents are better at money. We know this is not true. Listen, you're you're here learning about money, bettering yourself and working through your emotions around money, but most of our parents were never taught any of this. They weren't taught how to deal with their emotions around money, how to think about money from this perspective. And they they had a very different economic world that they were living in. Certainly probably your grandparents than you did. And they're out there just trying to figure all this stuff out too with sometimes a lot less information or access to information. Like, I am old enough, this may blow your mind, but I am actually old enough to remember before there was the internet. It did come early in my life, but I remember before there was such things as, you know, we were on computers and certainly before we had cell phones and, you know, before social media. And I am actually really happy that I had a, a chunk of my life that wasn't that. Because I know there's a difference now. And it's not to say one's better or worse. I just, I like having had those, those two perspectives. But our grandparents or, a lot, you know, my parents didn't grow up with any of this. And so they didn't have access to learn a lot of things that you now have at your fingertips. You're listening to this episode now. My parents, they still don't quite understand what a podcast is. <laughs> They often call it a blog, which I I find very humorous. But um, right, so we're we're all just out here doing our best. So 
I think it's it's perfectly okay to share your money goals and your milestones with your parents, but remember, their advice just might not always be the best advice for you. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. From Foreign Policy, I'm Rena Ninen, the host of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women. Over the past few years, we've looked at how women around the world are changing societal norms to increase their economic power. This season, we're focusing completely on girls, how they're pushing for a brighter, more powerful future, and what the rest of us can do to set them up for success. Join us for stories about girl power, young women who are fighting for change, to give themselves a chance to live a life of their own choosing. That's season six of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, wherever you get your podcasts. Want to know the number one money question I'm asked? It's how to get started investing without being overwhelmed. So if you're asking yourself the same question, then you have to check out the Investing for Beginners podcast. The hosts, Dave and Andrew, they break down investment terms and strategies in a way you can finally understand. I love that they're making investing accessible and they have an entire podcast dedicated to helping you invest better. Even if you're not ready to start investing, they explain the stock market and financial updates so you can really understand what is being said on the news. If you're ready to learn more about investing, I'd recommend you start with two of my favorite episodes. Listener Q&A, how do you start investing with a thousand bucks? Where they explain how you get started right away. And back to basics of building your portfolio, where they explain how to build a portfolio from scratch. The Investing for Beginners podcast is a great way to start expanding your relationship with money. Find Investing for Beginners podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. So we're on to money myth number seven. And another loaded one. I think I've saved all the loaded ones for for the last part of this episode. But that credit cards are bad. And yes, this is it's really juicy. And you know how I feel about this one if you've been listening to the show for a while. I think credit cards used wisely make a great deal of sense. If you say use a a points credit card like a debit card where you charge your monthly expenses and then you pay them off every month, you get all the benefits without the downsides like high interest rates and debt and all of the negatives that we hear about credit cards. I think there's a lot of misunderstood information. I know a lot of younger listeners who will, will ask me questions like, well, if I, if I take out a credit card and I go to Starbucks and I charge 25 bucks, it, you know, it, am I considered in credit card debt? And I'm like, no, 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 it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. If you pay off that 25 bucks, when your payment is due each month, then your balance is zero. You you don't have the interest rate to worry about. You're certainly not in credit card debt. The problem comes in, of course, when we charge more than we have and we can't pay it off in a reasonable time. So just, I know that might seem really basic, but I, I feel like it's worth reiterating. So I've, I've done credit card hacking myself to pay for trips and airfare with miles and points so many, so many times in my life. And it's it's honestly pretty nice. I like being able to use points to pay for certainly airfare or upgrades on airfare. Uh, Nerd Wallet is one of the sponsors of the show, and they have amazing recommendations for credit cards based on your credit score and uh, you know which which points or cashback cards work for you. Everybody's got something that they like better, but. I personally love being able to pay my monthly expenses that I would normally incur on my credit card, pay them off each month, and build points to be able to afford a free trip or free hotels or whatever it might be. That's something that's important to me, but that doesn't have to mean that it's important to you. So the myth part is just flapping the label, saying that credit cards are bad. So, you know, again, I'm going to beat a drum here. We've established that money is emotional. And if you aren't good with credit cards, 
and really the emotions around spending, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about impulse spending. We're talking about emotional spending when maybe you go out and spend because you don't you you don't feel good, you're anxious or you're depressed or just life is not going the way you want to. Or if you had a bad day, maybe you had an argument with your partner or your family or something at work happened. And it just, it does, it feels good to spend money. I'm not going to lie about that. It is a dopamine hit. It feels really good. And unfortunately, sometimes that that feeling, we want that feeling over and over and over and over and over again. And because everything's in our face all the time, it's easy to get to get in the in the train of thought of, well, I need that and I need that and I need that. I do this to myself. That's why I created my 24-hour online spend rule. I am notorious for having a million browsers open with a million different things that I want to buy, but I force myself to wait at least 24 hours before I put that puppy in the cart and I actually decide to buy that thing because I know that usually when I go back to my cart, I'm not actually going to want to buy those things. Or I'm like, why did I want that in the first place? So I know that about myself. It's probably one of the reasons that I I don't go shopping in stores. I, I just don't like to shop in stores personally, but it's it's one of the reasons I don't do that because sometimes my emotions and my impulses kind of take over for me. So you've got to know yourself and you've got to know the loops that you get stuck in. And if credit cards don't make sense for you now, don't use them. But it doesn't mean that they might not make sense in a few years. Maybe they don't. I don't know. But again, that's your choice, not mine or anybody else's to tell you. All right, we're going to go on another rant here. Money myth number eight, that being debt-free is always best. Whew, I got to take a breath for this one. Another explosive topic with so many opinions. Anytime I do an episode where I talk about maybe having debt isn't the worst thing, woo, I get a lot of comments back about that, but it's okay. It's okay. Here's the way I think about it. Debt that is expensive, like credit card debt with very high interest rates, can suck the life out of you. It's it's tough. You've you've got to climb out of that. You want to really work to pay that off ASAP. If you're having trouble doing that, dive into your spending. Make some conscious choices about how you're spending your money. Look at your bank statement every month. Find some ways to chip out 25, 50 bucks, anything extra. Put that extra money directly onto your credit card payment. Get those Get those credit cards paid off as soon as possible. But, asterisk mark, you are not a bad person if you have credit card debt. You are not. You might just need a little help sorting out some of the money emotions and behaviors to create an atmosphere and a plan. You need a plan too. We got to deal with the emotional side, but we also got to create a plan to help you pay that off. There's nothing wrong with that. Having a mortgage while you're in your working years and Potentially getting a tax deduction, I'd argue, yeah, kind of makes sense in a lot of cases. Student loan debt mm, can make sense, but I think you also need to think about the likelihood of paying them off. I know just full transparency here. When I went to grad school, I went to Pepperdine University in Los Angeles to get my master's in business, and student loans were given out like candy. And I, I didn't really think, I mean, I, I knew how much that was going to cost me, but I didn't really think about how much debt I would have. I was just focused on the degree. But now that I'm many years removed, I could have chosen a much less expensive college and still got an MBA. And you can't, un, you can't undo anything, right? But if you're thinking about going back to school, really check and, and see if it makes sense to make that kind of investment. Does it make sense for you to be in debt for X amount of years? Is there another option that might be less expensive? Or could you get a grant? Could you get a scholarship? Are there are there other ways that you could go about getting this goal without finding yourself in massive, massive student loan debt? I mean, I I could have gone to I had many other choices available to me. I could have gone to other schools and 
I think the hard thing now that I look back on it is nobody asks me where I got my MBA from. They don't care. Nobody cares really where you got your undergrad from. Maybe in certain certain fields, maybe if you're a doctor or a lawyer or something super specialized, maybe engineering, things like that. Maybe Maybe it does matter, but how many times are you walking around and somebody asks what you do? And then they follow up a question with like, oh, hey, where did you get your degree at? Most people don't do that. It just it just isn't the way. Certainly master's degrees aren't talked about that that same way. So just just my two cents on that. Money myth number nine, that every couple has to fight about money. I will tell you, I have helped very, very, very happy couples who actually have never had an argument about money. I know it might be hard to believe. <laughs> The key, I think, is just to be honest with each other, to share your stresses and to understand each other's money story from childhood. So how was your partner raised? How was money talked about or not talked about in their household? How do their parents still interact with money? That says a lot and it will help you understand the other person. And I really hope it will help you not shame them. I think also offering a safe space for your partner to share is critical. We we already do a lot of damage to ourselves by judging and shaming our own money choices. We really don't need to pile it on a partner because they're going through their own stuff. So please just be gentle with each other. Number 10 on the money miss is that you have to retire at a certain age. So the average age is 61. That is up from 57 in the 1990s. And that feels really young to me. And I don't, I, I think younger generations, just as my perspective, are adopting a mindset that they might not actually want to fully retire, which I love. Side hustles, things like rental real estate, and, and more are just helping people earn cash flow and love what they do later in life. And no one knows how long you're actually going to live. So I think it makes planning for retirement a bit tricky. Yes, you want to start investing the younger you are. The less you have to invest, the more time you have on your side. Compounding can do its magic, all of those things. But if you haven't done this exercise thus far, this is a really good one. Spend some time and think about what you want your retirement to look like. I don't care what age you are, just I don't know, create a little vision for it. When do you want to stop working? Do you want to continue working? Do you want to have a side hustle? If you were to create what your quote unquote retirement would look like now, Based off of what you know now, what would that be? Of course, it's going to change over time and it's going to evolve. But a lot of people are saying, I don't think I actually want to retire in my 60s or maybe not even my 70s. And I think that's great. It's it's such a personal choice. And the longer you work, obviously, the longer you have to save your money. So if you're somebody who's in your 40s or 50s and you don't have a lot saved for retirement, Maybe you're looking at 70s to retire, right? To to make up for not saving and investing earlier on. And that's okay. Finding something that you love to do is great. But I think the way we talk about retirement, it, it just needs it needs like an overhaul. It needs a, a redo, a putting up. Because I think it it gives you the idea that it has to be this certain way and at this certain age. And that causes even more money stress and anxiety. Okay. Laquita, this was fun. Thank you so much for this question. I hope everyone listening, I hope you've enjoyed this as well. I think I could have added a few more to this list, but these are the biggies. And again, I know it feels good to have rules, especially with money. We all want the crystal ball answers. We all want to know how to do it. But I will tell you that the biggest secret is to just figure out that you get to make your own money rules. You get to decide what comes first, how you spend your money. And I really want you to let 2024 be the year that your spending tells the story of you and not someone else. So an example of that is maybe you're keeping something up or you're doing something with your money that is to appease or help your spouse be proud of you or your parents or somebody else in your life. Maybe you're spending money on something uh, to keep in your friend group. And it just doesn't feel like it aligns with you any any longer. I want you to feel empowered. I want you to feel brave this year. 
I want you to feel purposeful that you can go in, you can look at your spending every month, and you can go back to that question of of thinking, I spent X on X. That's interesting. Do I like that? Do I not like it? Right? Put yourself back in the power place. If you enjoyed this, Ashana, and you would like to ask a question, you can head to the link in the show notes. That's the hub for all the links and the resources, as well as our podcast sponsors who make the show possible are linked. So use those, use those links. And again, share this episode, be a little bit aggressive like Laquita, grab some friends' phones and just, just add this show. Just tell them, just listen. You'll thank them later. All right. I will see you back here in a few days for a brand new episode. 